In this video, I will be building the twin mount 37mm anti-aircraft guns. These guns are quite a lot more complex than the single mount versions. The single mount version consisted of 7 parts, while this twin mount version contains 18 parts. Furthermore, I have to build twice the number of guns. There were only 4 of the single mount version, there are 8 of these. These guns also contain the smallest piece of photo etch I have ever worked with. It is this little wheel with a handle that is smaller than a grain of salt. This part is somewhat pointless, but I will get to that later in the video. These guns are constructed entirely out of photo etch. There are no plastic, resin or brass pieces. Flyhawk has provided these guns as a one-to-one -one replacement for the plastic guns that come in the trumpeter kit. You do not use any of the parts for these guns from the trumpeter kit, and the same number of guns are provided. Flyhawk has provided a few extra copies of the smaller and more delicate photo etch parts. Presumably these are the pieces that they expect the builders of these kits to lose or damage. They are not extra copies of all the parts, so it is not possible to build extra guns. I'll start the construction by working on the machinery block for the gun. This is a rectangular structure onto which I'll attach the gun barrels and the mechanism that is used to elevate the gun. In a similar fashion to the previous guns that I built, I'll fold them with the sides open so that I can access the inside to apply superglue. Once folded with the sides open, I apply extra thin superglue to the joint from the inside using a piece of wire gripped in a pin vise. This will allow me to bond the part together without having any glue marks from the outside of the box. Over the course of this video, you may see some footage for the parts of the single mount 37mm guns on the table. That is because I constructed both versions of these guns at the same time. I had intended to make a single video covering the construction of both of these versions, but it became apparent that because of how different they are and the amount of time it took to build them, they would be better to split them into their own videos. For smaller parts like this, it is important that you don't get a buildup of glue on the wire that you are using to apply the glue, otherwise you'll start to pick up too much glue and you will create a mess. So after each time I apply glue, I place the wire in a jar that contains a bit of acetone. Acetone will dissolve superglue and make it such that the wire is clean every time I use it to pick up the thin superglue that is in the trough made out of masking tape. That way I can be sure that I'm unlikely to apply too much glue to these parts and that I will keep them as clean as possible. In this sequence of video, I'm going to establish how I will, for the majority of this video, present the construction. That is, I'll talk through what I'm doing for the first one or two parts that I build, and then I will show the remaining copies completed in a rapid sequence. Since there are eight copies of everything that I build in this video, there is a lot of footage that has been recorded. From a viewer's perspective, I don't think it would be very enjoyable to watch a long video with playback simply sped up four times. After constructing the machinery blocks for the guns, I installed the gun barrels. The gun barrels in this detail kit are just pieces of photo etch. Brass barrels are much better, but photo etch is at least better than plastic. The problem with photo etch is that it is flat. You don't get the proper effect of a cylinder when viewing the gun directly from above or front on. However, with parts this small, it is not noticeable unless you are really looking for it. So, although I do much prefer brass barrels, I find photo etch barrels to be acceptable and still superior to plastic barrels. For light anti-aircraft guns, plastic barrels are almost always too large and look out of place. You can get by with resin barrels for 40mm guns, but they are extremely delicate. Often you'll find that photo etch barrels need to be folded in half. This gives them a better profile, makes them look more square. These ones don't require any folding. They are simply cut off the photo etch sprue and glued directly into the block. There are notches in the block that correspond to the notches on the base of the barrel. The fit of these notches is good. The barrels are easy to insert, but the fit is tight. To glue the barrels, I'm using extra thick super glue that I'm picking up directly with the barrel. I'm using extra thick super glue because it is slower drying and I want to be able to maneuver the barrel after I've inserted it into the block before the glue sets. Extra thin super glue will dry very quickly and it won't give me the opportunity to maneuver the part much. The extra thick super glue will allow me to maneuver the part for a few seconds before it hardens. I store the barrels in this way because they need to be correctly orientated to look right. It's more important that I get the vertical alignment correct and then I can, even after the glue has dried, bend the horizontal axis because it is just a thin piece of photo etch. Fortunately, the notches on the ends of these barrels are well matched to the notches in the block and they fit very well. This makes the installation process go quite smoothly. If the holes were too large or too small, 
then a lot of time would be spent either making the holes bigger, or if the holes were too big, trying to reposition the bells properly in the center. Since these holes are the correct size, none of that is necessary. Now for the semicircular structures that assist with the elevation of the gun. These parts need to be folded in half. Since the structures that connect the halves together are fairly far apart, at least further apart than the width of my tweezers, and because their structures are actually quite strong, I need to use a photo edge folding tool to fold these parts. With the photo edge folding tool, it will take a little bit more time to fold these parts, but you'll get a much better and safer bend on the parts. If you do not use the correct tool to fold photo etch, or if you use a tool that is too small, you run the risk of putting unwanted bends onto the photo etch, which can then cause damage. I often find that it's better to take my time with the part. I'd rather go slowly and get it right the first time than rush it and create a mess that then has to be corrected. Once the photo etch is folded most of the way, it can be pushed down with tweezers to complete the bend. The then fully folded pieces are clamped together with a set of tweezers and I use extra thin superglue applied to the seam to permanently stick the two halves together. The semicircular structures can then be stuck to the block. There is a nice notch that's been etched into the block which guides the location for the semicircle. Since the notch is fairly deep and well fitting to the part, the semicircle snaps in quite easily. The most important thing that needs to be done when attaching this part is to make sure that it's positioned vertically, 90 degrees to the block so that it doesn't look skew. I'm applying the glue to the notch on the block because if I were to apply the glue to the semicircle and then bring it into contact with the block and miss the notch, I would place excess glue on the block that I would have to remove. Whereas, if I place the glue on the block and then bring a dry part into contact with the block, if I miss it doesn't matter because the part is dry and if I hit the mark, it will make contact with the glue and bond. The gun, its barrels and the elevation mechanism will be painted in black. There is also a cap that sits on top of the gun, but that will be painted in light grey, therefore I cannot install it at this point. I will only be able to install that part after painting. So with the completion of the installation of the semicircles, this part of the build is complete until painting. That means we now need to move on to the construction of the mount. To start, I'll build the walls. This is the single largest piece of photo etch in the structure, and it holds the gun. The bottom of the structure is attached to the circular base. In the center of this part, there's a structure with some fingers that are used to position and hold what look like nets. Those fingers are very delicate, so I need to be careful. If I incorrectly fold the part, I could damage them, making it difficult to install the netting. I also need to be careful when applying the glue. I need the glue to not get in between those fingers, which could cause them to narrow or block the gap entirely. They need to be appropriately aligned and glued in place such that I can slot the photo edge net structures in the gaps. To do this, I'll fold the photo edge into its correct position, then use extra thin super glue from behind in the area that sits underneath the gun and apply it to the base and let capillary action pull the glue up on the sides of those fingers without blocking the gaps. Once the glue is in place, I slide a blade between the outermost fingers to spread them apart to ensure that proper contact is made between the outermost fingers and the walls of the mount. Overall, this is not a complicated piece to build. It's just a matter of being careful not to block or bend the fingers. While it would have been preferable to place the nets in the holder before applying the glue, it is not possible because the nets need to be painted in black and the mount needs to be painted in light gray. The layer of paint that will be applied to the mount and the net will also increase the thickness of the parts, making the fit a bit tighter. So I will need to be careful or this could become quite complicated later in the build. Apart from being careful with the fingers, this part is easy to fold. It is a large piece with good folding lines etched into the metal. As such, it can be easily folded in your fingers with tweezers. No special tools are required. There isn't a line to indicate the vertical position for the fingers. You have to position that by eye. Before the mounts are stuck to the base, discs need to be glued underneath the base. These are just spacing discs to slightly lift the base off the deck. They are simple to fold and will be completely concealed under the base. Despite being simple to fold, I did manage to break the first one that I folded. There are fold lines etched into the part and if you don't fold it such that the etched line is on the outside, the circles will break apart. This happened due to a lapse in concentration. I looked at the parts and thought this will be quick and easy. I don't need to think about this. 
and I immediately broke a simple part. Fortunately, it is easy to glue back together. This illustrates why it is important to take it slowly. I rushed the work and then had to spend time correcting mistake. It is difficult to always pay full attention to what you're building, but it is amazing how quickly things start to go wrong, even when you are just a little bit distracted. Once folded into a stack, I applied extra thin superglue to the seam to permanently bond them together. In this case, I'm not cleaning off the superglue with acetone for each part. That is because precision is not important here. These parts are going underneath the base and will not be visible. Therefore, any amount of excess glue that does get onto these surfaces will not be visible. I then glued the discs to the base while they were still on the sprue. There is no need to remove them at this time and the sprue will make it easier to handle the parts. There are no markings to locate the disc on the base. I'm trying to keep them roughly centered, but I'm not overly concerned if they are a bit off center since these parts will be concealed. To glue them down, I place them dry on the base, then apply extra thin super glue at the edge of the disc. Capillary action will pull the glue underneath the part and create a good bond. I'm not concerned about excess glue underneath the base because it'll not be visible once the guns are installed on the ship. With the second disc, I was once again rushing and made another mistake. The disc was too far off center for my liking, so I pried it off with a blade, recentered it and stuck it down again. As soon as I start building a part that I feel is simple or unimportant, I get lazy and start making mistakes. It is frustrating. So as much as I say, take it slowly, be careful, check before you glue, as you can see, I find it difficult to follow that advice all the time and I do start rushing. It always has the same result. It makes things go more slowly because I have to do corrections. I must say though, this particular work with gluing these discs onto the bases, it might sound silly, but I actually really liked it. It's the kind of photo etch work that is nice and relaxing. It's very easy to do, and when using the right tools and glue, it's quick. It feels like you're making progress. Quite often with photo etch, you spend a long time on such a small thing and you don't really feel like you're ever going to finish it. It feels like you're stuck. But with installing these discs on the bases, because of the pace at which you're able to move and install them, it feels like you're making progress. I've said it before, but at this stage of the build, it really feels like you aren't making progress. You put many hours of work into the ship and it hardly changes its appearance. So it's quite nice to have a part of the build where you can feel, if not see, a little bit of progress coming along. After sticking the discs to the underside of the bases, I could then start installing the structures on the top of them. I decided to keep them on the sprue just to help keep everything aligned. There's no need to cut these parts off the sprue at this stage, or the joins are still easily accessible. To install the mounts to the base is very easy. It's easier on these guns than it was for the single mount version. On these bases, Flyhawk etched a fairly deep recess, which perfectly aligns and fits with the mount. This helps greatly with aligning the parts correctly. All you need to do is place the mount dry in the recess square such that it clicks into place and push it to the front of the base. There is a small gap with no detail where you can apply the glue from the back underneath where the gun will sit. Flyhawk have provided you with a good fit and a place to locate the mount the good place to apply the glue. It all aligns very nicely. This enables you to move quite quickly on this phase of the installation. I really appreciate this kind of design. Flyhawk has thought about how these parts will be constructed and has provided some features to make it easier. Often they will just etch a line which you have to try and align the parts against. This can be quite tricky and time consuming because these parts have a correctly sized tray for the amount to sit in. You don't have to manually position the part. You can feel when it's in the correct position. You don't even have to look at it. It makes it so much easier to build and you get a better result. That brings us to the end of the easy parts to install for these anti-aircraft guns. The parts will now get small and delicate. Yes, these were not the small parts. There are a lot of structures that need to be connected to the sides of these mounts. Before they can be glued on, they need to be constructed. I'm going to start with this block that contains some of the control surfaces for the guns. This is not a simple block. It has a wheel that sticks out on a thin piece of photo etch and a second wheel on the other end of the block that stands up vertically. If it was just a matter of folding a cube, this process would be simple but tedious. These delicate protruding structures complicate the process. 
It is difficult to fold the part this small without damaging these delicate parts. It is difficult to find a place even to hold the part by folding it. I find making these parts quite frustrating. This is definitely not my favorite part of building a ship, but it is something that I have to get through. After working the parts into a good enough shape, I apply extra thin super glue to the seam on the side without detail. This is the face that we stuck to the wall of the mount. For parts like these, I won't try to apply glue to all the seams. I don't think there's really a point to that because with such small parts, it's going to be difficult just to get the glue to go to the correct place. It was also not as if these parts need to be strongly bonded because they aren't structural. Once the gun is stuck to the ship, it is never going to be moved again. And if you do manage to knock them while they're on the ship, well, let's just say you have a bigger problem to deal with than a small part shifting out of shape. So let's just not go there. These parts really only need to be stuck down well enough to survive painting with the airbrush and being handled until they are installed on the ship. With small parts like this, I depart from my usual production line method of construction. That is because I'm concerned about losing or damaging small parts, especially parts as small and numerous as these. There will be a combined total of 144 pieces on these eight guns once complete. So, in order to keep the number of loose pieces down, I'll glue them in place as soon as each piece is folded. That way, I need to keep track of the larger parts, and I don't have to worry about losing or squashing the smaller parts. The spacing between these mounts is quite tight, but for at least this part of the installation, there's still enough space for me to work. I quite like having all these parts perfectly aligned to each other, as it allows me to compare the location of the boxes between the mounts. For parts this small, it's quite difficult to get them all to look identical, but where possible, I want them to look as much like each other as possible. Now to speed this up, I'll complete the installation with a quick montage. If only I could do that in real life. Somewhat unbelievably, I think that was the easier of the two boxes to make. The next one is L-shaped. Well, I suppose it's not necessarily a more difficult box to make, but it has its own set of challenges. Firstly, being an L-shape means there are more bends and they don't all go in the same direction. Although it is a thinner box with more bends, fortunately it does not have any delicate protrusions. Having said that, this box has one little quirk, and you can see it in the instruction diagram that is in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. There you can see a part labeled F5. That needs to be stuck to the end of the L-shaped block. There's a little circle etched into the face of the block that is located in the center of the T-junction of part F10. That is where the wheel needs to be placed. Now, if you're like me, you're looking at this and wondering why it is they decided this needed to be done. That wheel could very easily just have been etched directly into the part at the center of the T-junction. Essentially, all that little piece of photo etch, much smaller than a grain of salt is doing, is putting a handle on a very, very small wheel. I don't know what Flyhawk was thinking. I don't know if they were thinking that this is some crucial piece of detail that needs to be placed on these anti-aircraft guns, or if they had designed this in CAD software and not realized how small it would be once manufactured to scale. Regardless, I don't think that they considered the implications of including a part this small. At best, it amounts to an unnoticeable piece of detail that consumed time to install. At worst, it results in a loss of detail due to excess glue covering details on the part. To get the builders of these anti-aircraft guns to install miniature wheels for the sole purpose of adding a handle is pointless. I think we could have done without that handle, but they provided the part, so I used it. After folding all the L-shaped blocks, I placed them on a piece of masking tape to hold them for the installation of the wheel. Somewhat surprisingly, despite the very small size of the wheels, the installation was actually not all that difficult. Once these blocks were aligned on the masking tape, I took a piece of wire and put a little drop of super glue on the recessed circles. I was then able to pick up each of those little wheels by their handles and drop it onto the small drop of glue and use the point of the tweezers to push it into place. Although not very difficult, I still think it was unnecessary. The level of detail that is achieved by having a separate handle on these wheels is negligible. In fact, I would say there is a greater chance that a person will conceal detail 
by applying too much glue to the part, then this part will add to the mount. I think Flyhawk did this in error, and that they didn't really intend to produce a part this small. One thing that is apparent is that they provided an additional four of these wheels, and when you see that, it usually means the manufacturer knew that this would be a tricky part of the build, or at least it would be a part that would be easily lost. For most of the parts in these twin mount guns, they provide you with the eight parts that you need to build the eight guns that have to be installed in the ship. But for these wheels, they provided 12. To me, that says that perhaps this was intentional. They really thought it was a good idea for people to install these wheels so they can have a little handle on them. They thought, well, this is going to be difficult to do or parts are going to get lost. So let's just give them 50% extra. Either way, I think it was a strange decision. If I had designed this kit, I would have just etched the wheel into the block and forgone the handle. The irony is that because of how small this part is, I've pointed it out to people. So it actually does get seen. Perhaps Flywalk was making a talking point for those of us who build this kit. Although I had wanted to install the L-shaped blocks at this point, I realized that it would be a mistake. The seats for the gun crew sit underneath this block. So if I were to install the block first, I would obstruct the view of the location where the seat needs to be attached. This would be a mistake and make construction more complicated. Since I would now be working on the other side of the mount, there was no longer enough space between the parts while attached to the sprue. They were just too close to each other. So for the next phase of the construction, I removed them from the sprue and placed them on a card to give myself more room to work. The mounts were then ready for the installation of the seats. These seats are one of the more difficult, if not the most difficult part of these anti-aircraft guns to build and install because they are incredibly delicate. It's a little more than a wire that you have to bend into a structure with a seat, a control wheel and pedals that sticks out of the side of the mount without any additional supports. The only surface available to glue the seat to the mount is the end of a piece of wire. For this seat, there's a control wheel that needs to be folded. This is another case of unnecessary detail. Presumably, Flyhawk wants this wheel to look the same from both sides, but there's really not much detail on the part anyway, and one side faces the mount. They could have easily etched this as a single vertical wheel that does not need to be folded. However, all things considered, folding this wheel in half and applying a little bit of glue is not the most complicated thing. The far more complicated part is sticking the whole structure to the side of the mount. After bending the parts, I install on the mount using extra thick super glue. These parts are very small and awkwardly shaped, so you have to hold them still in the correct location for a few seconds for the glue to begin to grip. If you release the part too soon, it'll move and sag. It is then a matter of pushing and holding the part in position until the glue is strong enough to hold. Unfortunately, this part of the video is overexposed. At this point, I was quite focused on building these guns and getting these small and tricky pieces installed while paying attention to make sure that what I was doing was in frame. I wasn't paying enough attention to the exposure. It is a bit difficult to see what I'm doing and unfortunately, I do have it overexposed for quite a long time, but I do eventually realize that I'm overexposing the image and I do correct it. Folding these parts is quite tricky. It is a very delicate job. You don't have a lot of opportunity to fold these parts. If you try and bend the part too many times, you will cause the photo etch to fail and break apart. On a part this small, you really don't want to have to glue it back together. So you have to be careful to bend it as few times as possible. You want to get it into the right position and then get it glued to the mount as quickly as possible. After repeating this eight times, all the left hand side seats were installed. Now for the right hand side seats. The crew seat on the right side of the mount does not require any parts to be glued together. That makes it very slightly simpler than the left side. Because there are additional folds on this part, I'm going to leave it attached to the sprue. This will help it keep its shape while it's being handled. For this photo etch, which is incredibly delicate, it will be very easy for one of those wheels to snap off. While bending the pedals, one of the wheels got knocked off. It must have been too rough with it. That is frustrating. These pieces are so incredibly delicate and small and now I have to glue one back together. To do this, I'm going to use a little bit of thick super glue applied to the part, and then hope that I can grip the wheel and hold it. After cutting all of the seats of the sprue, I can begin gluing them to the mount. The sooner I get these parts installed and on the ship, the better. Having them loose on the table 
is just a recipe for disaster. They are just so very delicate and small. They are very easy to lose. The right side seats are installed in much the same way as they did for the left side. Parts wise, they are basically identical. They are just mirrored with a slightly different orientation for the wheel. There isn't actually a slot on the walls of the mount to insert the wire into. There's only a square etched into the wall to indicate where it should be attached. I think if they had made a slot to insert them into, it would have made these parts a lot easier to install. This could have been done in a similar fashion to those slots for the gun barrels. The other thing that they could have done is attach the seats to the walls of the mount in such a way that you only have to fold them into position without needing glue. After installing the right side seats, the lowest level of the detail is now in place. So I can move on to installing the detail above it. That meant I could now install the L-shaped boxes. Compared to the seats, this is considerably easier. The thick super glue is strong enough to hold the part on contact while still giving you a few seconds for the part to be moved into the correct position. Again, I'm looking at the markings on the wall to determine the correct location for the block and I'm comparing each mount to its neighbor. Above all, I'm trying to make them look consistent. To install these parts, I apply a little drop of extra thick super glue to the side of the mount and then place the L-shaped block on top of the drop of glue. I'm being very careful to not put on too much glue. I don't want it to be pushed out of the sides. I just want enough glue to hold the part in place. Considering how light these parts are, you really do not need a lot of glue. Effectively, you just need enough glue to hold it in place such that when you spray it with the airbrush, it doesn't get blown off. Finally, it is time for the last seat to be installed. This is what I believe to be the gun commander's or gun captain's seat. Of all the seats, this is the easiest one by far. The backrest of the chair needs to be folded into the vertical position and the part glued to the side of the mount. The instructions do not indicate where this seat should be installed, so I looked for photos of the mount to find the correct position. Although easy to prepare, it suffers from the same problems as the other seats. That is that the whole structure needs to stick to the side of the mount by a thin photo etch bar. There's no tab or hole which you can slide the bar into on the mount, which means your contact surface for the glue is very small. Despite that, it is a smaller piece than the others, which does make it a little bit easier to attach. But still, as I said, for the other chairs, Flyhawk should have provided a better mechanism for attaching these parts. Here, I finally noticed that the video was overexposed and I corrected it. You'll now be able to see better what I'm doing. One of the problems that I have with this channel, especially for this type of work, is that it's very small and I don't have proper cameras to film it. To film properly, I need a number of cameras with macro lenses set up around the workstation so that you can see the detailed work. At this point, this channel is not monetized. It is really just a hobby. So I'm using old cell phones as the cameras to record this video. This means that my ability to capture very fine detail is quite limited. It's videos like this, or at least making videos like this that make me realize I need to try and get this channel monetized so I can start making better quality videos using better equipment. At long last, all the seats are installed. That is quite a relief. I did not like that. I would guess that this was the most difficult part of the build for this whole ship. Certainly the most difficult part of the construction work that I've done on this ship. I don't think there will be photo etch parts that are more complicated than this. I'm very glad to have this behind me. The only thing left that is more repetitive than these guns are the 20 millimeter guns. And there are 14 of those. But they have fewer parts and appear to be less complicated to build. But I'll find out when I get to them. Provisionally, I think that these are the most difficult single components that need to be constructed for this ship. The last part that needs to be constructed before painting is this cover that goes on the top of the gun. This will be sprayed in light grey. That is why I have not already glued it to the gun. These parts have a curve on them. As you will know, those are not my favourites. But these parts have lines etched into the underside that will help with folding. For parts this small, with a fold that is fairly simple, you can fold them with tweezers if they have lines etched into them like this. You don't need to roll them over a cylinder. To bend them, I will hold one end with locking tweezers and use a second set of tweezers to make the curve. 
I'm trying to bend the part to fit the side walls. I think this is the easy way to fold these parts. Using a cylinder and getting into that little gap will be quite challenging. Also, the side walls are fairly strong and can help with making the bend. I don't think there's much to be gained from trying to get a perfect curve by bending this part over a cylinder. It will be difficult to notice any difference between using this method and folding it around a cylinder once they have been painted and installed. The photo etch is now as constructed as it can be before painting. As I previously mentioned, these guns will be painted in two colors, light gray and black. I'll start by painting the caps, followed by the mounts. These parts go in the light gray. This color is a mix of paint that I got from the instructions that came with the trumpeter kit. At the very beginning of the build, I mixed approximately 50 milliliters of this color. That was to ensure that I had enough of this paint to get through the entire build without having to mix more and attempt to color match. The guns themselves are painted in black. Black is very concealing, so it is not great for details since it will make them difficult to see. I did look online for photographs of real examples of these guns in museums, and this is the correct color combination. The machinery of this gun is painted in black, including its barrel. Even though it is not an ideal color to use for these parts, I felt compelled to use it because it is accurate with what these guns actually looked like. Having said that, I will try to bring out some detail later on. I'll use light gray panel line to highlight some of the detail. Unfortunately, the details on these parts are incredibly small, so even with the panel line, it'll be very difficult to see them. The last thing to paint are these panels. I'm not sure what they are. They could be some kind of netting, possibly to catch casings after the shells have been fired. With flat pieces of photo etch like this, you do have to be careful to spray them from all angles. If you spray just top down or from one angle, when you view them from the opposite angle, you'll see a shadow on that side. It is a bit frustrating that something like this, which is very flat, can't be simply sprayed from one side. After letting the color coat dry for a few hours, I then sprayed everything with Tamiya X22. X22 is a clear glass varnish. I'm using the acrylic version. The glass varnish serves two purposes. Varnish has a much harder finish than regular paint. This means it is more scratch resistant. To help protect the model from bumps and scrapes while it is being handled. Although for parts this small, if you're bumping them and scratching them, then the paint is going to be the least of your problems. The second purpose is to help with the application of panel line. Although not strictly necessary if you have used acrylic paint, I still apply a gloss varnish because I find that the gloss finish makes the panel line run more easily. If you don't apply the gloss coat, then you can get an almost blotchy effect with the panel line, and I don't like that. I like the parts to look quite clean, with the panel line most being used to bring out the detail. The gloss coat will help the paint flow over the undetailed surfaces and get to the detail. If your color coat is an enamel paint, then this is a crucial stage, and you must cover your paint with an acrylic varnish. If you do not, then you won't be able to remove the panel line without removing your color coat. Turpentine will dissolve enamel paints. Now to try and liven up these black parts with a bit of gray panel line. Apply it in the same way as I would with the black panel line, with the intention being that it highlights some of the detail. I don't expect this effect to be nearly as good as the black panel line on the light gray parts. I find it quite difficult to bring out the detail on these black parts. I don't think there's much that can be done about that. For the black panel line on the gun mounts, I'm not going to follow the usual process, which will be to put on a lot and then remove the excess with mineral turpentine. The reason for that is that these parts are incredibly small and delicate, and I want to keep handling them to a minimum. I also suspect that because the detail is so fine, that if I try to pick up the panel line with turpentine, it will remove too much and be counterproductive. In this case, I'm using the solvent that is in the panel line and the glass coat to push the panel line to where the details are and remove it from the undetailed parts. This will make these parts a little bit darker than usual, but because they are so small, the slight difference in color will not be noticeable. After leaving the panel line to dry for a few minutes on the black parts, I did remove the slight panel line with turpentine. I felt that I had applied too much to the parts. These parts are considerably simpler than the mount, so there's little risk of doing damage to them. 
Removing the excess panel line did make some of the detail harder to see, but I think the effect is better. I think it is better to have it look more black, with some detail slightly visible, than it is to have it look too light with a lot of detail visible. I think it is a better representation of what these guns really looked like. Now that the parts are painted, final assembly can begin. I started by gluing the light grey caps to the top of the gun. This is a fairly simple process. Extra thick super glue was applied to the bottom of the cap, and then the cap was placed in its location on the top of the gun. Extra thick super glue dries a bit slower than regular super glue, giving me time to push the part into its correct position. Locking tweezers were very useful for holding these parts. By using two sets, I could work on one part while the glue was drying on another part. By the time I had finished working on a part, the glue had finished drying on the other part, so it could be handled to free up the tweezers that were being used to hold it. This enabled me to rapidly install the caps on all the guns. It was at this point that I got a bit carried away. The end was in sight, and I suppose I started rushing again. I was overexcited and moved on to installing the guns on the mounts. This was a bit of a mistake, because what I had failed to realize was that I had not installed the nettings. They go immediately underneath the guns, and by installing the gun on the mount at this stage, I was obstructing the installation of the nets. I only realized that after I installed half the guns on their mounts. After realizing my mistake, I switched from installing the guns to installing the nets. The hope was that I'd be able to maneuver the nets into place without having to remove the gun. I did not want to have to break apart the glue because that has a high chance of damaging the photo etch. And I could not use solvent because that would destroy the paint. Although it was a bit awkward, it wasn't impossible. I could slip the nets past the guns and get them into the slots. It was awkward because I didn't have easy access to the top of the structure and my view was obscured, which made aiming the part more challenging. It was harder to see if the parts were correctly aligned. Fortunately, the excess paint that was on these parts at this stage hadn't made them too thick to fit. The fit was tight, but not overly so. For this work, I needed even more light and wanted some magnification, so I brought up my light ring with a magnifying glass. It wasn't all that helpful because the slots were being concealed by the top of the gun, so I couldn't get a good angle on it, but having more light was helpful. After getting the nets installed in the first gun, I was relieved. I knew it would be difficult, but possible, to complete the installation without needing to unbond parts. I then proceeded to complete the procedure for the remaining three guns. I'm quite sure that there is no way that you can tell which guns had the nets installed before the guns and which guns had the nets installed after the guns. It is considerably easier to install the nets and the mounts before the guns, so for the next four, I made sure to do it in the correct order. I quickly cut out all 16 of the nets and then quickly ran through the final four mounts and inserted the nets into the slots. Once they were all inserted and pushed down properly, I placed a little bit of extra thin super glue on the top of the nets near the fingers. This will ensure that the nets are properly stuck down and won't move. While doing this work, I did scratch the paint a little bit on some of these parts and then had to do a bit of touch up with a fine paintbrush, nothing that's really noticeable. But when working with metal on metal, there's always a risk that the paintwork will be damaged. I think it's inevitable. Fortunately, it is easy to touch up because of the weathering and the nature of these guns. Those touch-ups will be concealed very well. After the nets were installed, I then continued with the installation of the guns, now doing this in the correct order, but following the exact same process as before. For the most part, these guns are held in place by friction. In some cases, the arms that attach the gun to the mount needed to be spread out a bit so that the part could fit, but once spread out the appropriately sized gap, the gun would fit quite easily. This enabled me to position the gun without any glue applied, which gave me time to position it in the correct orientation. I wanted to make sure that it was level and pointing at the correct angle. Once I was happy with the position of the gun, I used extra thin super glue to stick it in place. With the guns fully constructed, the last part of the assembly was to apply the matte coat. This will seal on the panel line and remove the gloss effect. The matte coat will also have the effect of making the paint look like a lighter shade of its color. The matte coat is not a protective layer. It is very thin and can be easily scratched. The majority of the scratch protection will come from the gloss varnish. 
The fully assembled and painted guns could then be installed on the ship. Two of the guns go on the B turret. There are holes formed into the plastic that indicate the location of the mounts. The holes are fairly large, but not so large as to swallow up the disc that was installed under the base of the mount and small enough to be completely concealed by the mount. I did use quite a lot of thick super glue, I almost completely filled the holes with glue, but I was mostly trying to place a ring of glue around the perimeter of the hole, given that that is the only part of the deck that will come into contact with the mount. While the glue is still wet and drying, I move the gun into its final position. I prefer the guns on my ships to all be orientated in the same direction and to be set to the same angle of elevation. When placing guns side by side, I choose two guns that look very similar to each other. I want to try and make the ship look as symmetrical as possible. I then repeated the process for the sea turret. Once again, I chose two guns that look similar to each other so that they would look good next to each other. And then to glue the mounts to the ship, I applied thick super glue to the mounting hole and placed the gun on top of the glue. The installation of the guns on the midship wings is exactly the same as for the guns on the turrets. With the installation of these 37mm anti-aircraft guns, the work for this video is complete. I must say I am very glad to have these guns behind me. They were quite tedious to build and quite difficult with all their small and delicate parts. This breaks the back of the anti-aircraft guns for this ship. Although I'm only a little under halfway through the number of guns that have to be built, the 20mm guns that still need to be constructed look to be a lot simpler to assemble. In the next video, I'll construct the 20mm anti-aircraft guns. Thanks for watching. Cheers.